I'm Lonnie Bedwell, and you're watching my episode of Like a Farmer. Hey, y'all. It's Pat with Like a Farmer. Welcome to another episode. Today, I have Lonnie Bedwell from Pleasantville, Indiana. Lonnie was the 2015 National Geographic Adventurer of the Year, and he is the first blind person to paddle through the Grand Canyon. Lonnie, thanks for coming on today. What a great story you're about to tell the viewers. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you having me here. And welcome to Florida. Yeah, well... Yeah. First time to Florida? No, I've been to Tampa several times to Florida. I was actually stationed in Orlando uh, when I was in the Navy back in 85, 86. Okay, good. Well, we're going to definitely talk about that and a lot of other things today. I want to start off with where you're from, family, experiences. Just start from the beginning. I want to know who Lonnie Bedwell is. Yeah, I was, like I said, I was born and raised in that little town, Pleasantville, Indiana, population 120, if, if you count the dogs and chickens. Uh, Raised there my whole life, started school there. They shut down the school. I had, had I think, somewhere around nine or 10 people in my class. Consolidated uh, with a town of Duggar, and I ended up graduating in 1983 with about 34, 35 people in my class. And attended Vincennes University for a couple of years for robotics. Joined the Navy after that, uh, served for nine years active, uh, was a submariner. Okay. Went through the nuclear power program and uh, got off of active duty in in uh, 94. Uh, joined the Army National Guard and in three years to the day, I uh, got off active duty. I was involved in a hunting accident that took my eyesight. Yeah. So Lonnie, let's back up a little bit. So Pleasantville, Indiana. And when you think about like a farmer, like a farmer, the idea was to celebrate rural America, celebrate the American farmer, and educate the American people. Mm -hmm. So when you think about rural America, I mean, Indiana, right? I mean, you put that first on the map when it comes to rural America. Talk to me about your farming background. I know you came from um, a farming family history, and I think maybe you still have a farm today. Can you hit on that a little bit? Yeah, uh, you know, me and I have one brother. Who had, we were raised on just a little little plot of land but we always had uh, uh you know two or three calves and raised them and 10 well eight to 10 11 12 hogs chickens and rabbits and our whole lives and, oh yeah and then uh you know my family some of my extended family and all around us you know grain and crop and uh you know uh, beans and and soybeans and corn and Currently, my dad and, and I, we share a little bit of property, we have about 30 acres tillable, and it's planted in beans this year. And uh, so myself, I live on six and a half acres and yep. have a guy put up, put a little bit of it up in hay. That's awesome. So you, you joined the military, you went to the Navy, and I appreciate you for your service. And mm -hmm. as we were talking before, um, I went into the Navy after my first year of college, and um, what a great experience. So we both have a common... Uh, a common place that we visited which was great lakes illinois i went in february when did you go to great lakes I, oh, I started in august and went all the way through until about may of the next year okay so you were smart i went in february when it would i want to yeah. say it might have been the coldest one of the coldest winters that great lakes experience was that february so i uh, yeah. i learned to be tough going into going into boot camp you got out of the military lonnie and you talk about the accident that made you blind i want to i want to hit on that and if you don't mind just kind of tell me what happened yeah i was without turkey hunting me and a good friend of mine uh, we raced together our entire lives and both went to the service and and come out and we just got up on a sunday morning to go turkey hunting i had harvested a turkey the day before so i didn't even have a gun with me and i was just out there calling for him and we separated intentionally and and kind of was working our way back together. And I don't know that either one of us really understand how it happened, but uh, I distinctly remember feeling this aura surround me and everything went silent. The wind stopped, the birds quit chirping and I was just felt enveloped. And I started to squat down to my knees and uh, raise my hands up and I heard the boom. And you know, I took that full shotgun blast to the face at about nine steps. Mm. And I didn't see him any more than I think he saw me. He was shooting at a bird. And uh, 
So yeah, that's how I got shot. When you think about an accident to that caliber and now moving forward without eyesight, I mean, tell me what gave you the passion and the energy and the excitement and the heart to do the stuff that you've done to, to this date today? Well, it started with my children. And I want to step back one thing, too. And I love the way you said eyesight instead of vision. Because yep. I tell people all the time, I lost my eyesight, but I truly believe I gained vision. And uh, Hit on that. Why do you say that? Because, uh, you know, eyesight's a function of vision. But I, I truly feel like, you know, in, in the gaining of vision, I, I see things from a completely different perspective. Things that I was so blind when I had eyesight, I didn't take the time to think about or, or view, you know, other people's opinion, what's truly valuable. I, I don't see things, so I don't know they exist. It makes me realize what's truly important, what I need, not what I want, um, and how people is what makes this world go around. Things are just, you know, and nature, you know, just the love. I miss seeing it so much, but I can still experience it and the smells and the sounds and just the feel of it so much more, I think. Than, yep. Yeah. That's a great mentality to have. Yeah. And you've been doing a lot of things over the, the re what year did you lose your eyesight? I lost my eyesight in May, in, uh, on May the 4th, 1997. Okay. So from 97 to now. I want to talk about the stuff that you've been advocating for. So one of it's Sightless Summits, mm -hmm. and you've been helping other blind veterans as well. Can mm -hmm. you hit on kind of the stuff that you've been doing? Yeah, Sightless Summits is, is, a, is kind of a brand that we come up with, and we teamed up with the Blinded Veterans Association. I, it's kind of funny for me to step back just a little bit. I didn't go to a blind rehab center uh, until... 2010, December 2010 going into 2011. And I didn't do that because I was a single father raising my three girls. And when my youngest daughter graduated, I went. But while I was up there, they asked me, they said, Lonnie, we know blind people snow ski, but we've never done it here as a recreational outing. Will you be our guinea pig? Because we need to find something to do for these younger veterans. I said, twist my arm. If they can do it, we can do it. And I never did any of these adaptive sports before I lost my yep. eyesight. Uh, so it started there. And, and then while I was up there, I met these four guys who lost their eyesight as a result of combat. And one of them was asked to go to an event the following spring, uh, water skiing and sailing and stuff. And, and he told the organization, he said, I'm not going to go unless you bring Lonnie. I said, he's blind, you're not. If he goes, I'll go. And I'm... Um, so they asked me if I'd do it, and I said, hey, I'm there, I'm there, and we're going to do this. And uh, So it just kind of exploded from there, me getting asked to go to these events, and um, kind of as a, because I knew I'd take on the challenge. Yeah. And I, I, I truly consider it my next duty assignment, you know, is to try to go outside the box, what even my comfort level a lot of times but to do it for a reason. Yeah, and, and to help others. Yeah. Well, you have been going outside of your box, and the reason why I say that is because you climbed Mount Everest, and I don't even, I can't, I'm trying to even, even fathom the fact of, number one, climbing Mount Everest, and me. I know, uh, I know there might be a lot of viewers that might think I don't have any athletic abilities, but it's even hard for me just to climb these small hills that we have in the great state of Florida. But you not only climb Mount Everest, but you climb the mountain without your eyesight. Like, hit on that. Like, how do you even prepare for that? Why do you do it? I mean, was there, when you're climbing the mountain, was there any time or a point where you're like, what the hell am I doing? I mean, just go into the day that it started, the day that you wanted, that you knew you wanted to climb Mount Everest and then start with the day that you did climb it. I could truly step back because like I said, there was another friend of mine who lost his eyesight in Afghanistan and we'd been climbing together in Colorado and he asked me to climb Kilimanjaro with him. And I said, yeah, and just before we went. And that he, was the first one you climbed? That was the first mountain. Okay. So yeah. I had no aspirations to climb these big mountains. It, kind of I really didn't and 
anyway, he developed spinal meningitis, leaving not only blind or deaf. And and I remember him. You know, the only way we could communicate was to spell letter by letter in his hand and listening to him repeat those letters and repeat those words. When I told him I wasn't going to climb without him, and he screamed at me. He said, "No, no, no, no! You climb for me. You climb for us. You climb for all of us." And that just instilled it for me. And so I did that. It's and every and every time I climbed, when I climbed, I said, "I got to get a rock for him and another friend who lost his eyesight in Iraq." And so then I was asked to go to climb Aconcagua by another veteran who lost his eyesight in combat. And he said, will you join me on that mountain? I said, sure, well, yeah, I'll go with you. Let's go do this. And, and while we were there, I met a gentleman named Michael Neal who just stuck his head in the tent and introduced himself. Well, a few months down the road, I get a phone call. I'm talking to the executive director of the Blinded Veterans Association. And he asked me, he said, Lonnie, I know you do some of this extreme stuff every now and then. He said, would the next thing you have in mind, will you join with us to bring awareness to the Blind Veterans Association? I said, sure. I said, I have nothing lined up, but sure, if something comes along, I will. Two or three days later, I got a call from Michael Neal, who happened to be sitting in the ball at the base of Mount Everest. He wow. said, how would you like to climb Everest? I just lowered my head and I'm like, oh. okay, I got a call from the BVA. I got a call from you. It's meant to happen. Let's, let's try to figure out if we can make it happen. And that's how it started. Uh, uh, Truly, the uh, the big mountain climbing is not my favorite thing to do. Yeah. It truly isn't. But, uh, you know, so we went and climbed Mount Denali up in Alaska as a prep for it. And then this past April, we went over and climbed Mount Everest. So it was last April that you climbed Mount this, Everest? This, just a few months ago, yeah. Was there ever – oh, so it was this year. This I year? mean, it was just a couple months ago. Yes. Was there ever a time that you were climbing Mount Everest and you were like, hey, I think we need to – turn around oh yeah i mean yeah definitely there's times we're trying to cross over crevasses or get cold and windy and and you know and <laughs> um you know, you'd be thinking or you just get tired you know the oxygen level up high got tired and, and, and quite frankly um you know when you'd see them bring somebody off the mountain who didn't make it uh, flying them off on a helicopter or passing somebody that didn't make it how many times i mean is that a common Thing. Well, this was the deadliest year in the history of Everest. Seventeen people didn't make it. And wow. When uh, we literally passed a guy on our summit day uh, that was perishing right there around us, and it was very humbling. And you know, so, but, what makes you want to? I mean, what made you want to keep doing it? Seems like you gained this passion after your accident. Well, simply on that mountain, it was quite frankly, uh, I knew it was close to Memorial Day. And I knew all the people that follow and watch and these, these veterans that are disabled. And, and uh, every time I feel like, man, you don't got to do this. It'd be like, take another step, man. Take another step. They give you everything they had. They deserve everything you have. Take another step. And that's them and my family and the sponsor. That's what pushed me up that mountain. Truly did. It's uh, an unbelievable story. Yeah. I, I, I do this stuff with a passion to hopefully encourage people to realize what is truly possible. You know, not just the disabled, but everyone out there to believe in themselves and what they can do, to believe in their value, their purpose. They still have worth. And if we'll simply help each other, what can we not do? Yep. Um, that, yeah. I mean, those words that you just said, it's it's one of those things that, the, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we started Like a Farmer, because we are sitting here fighting, trying to educate people around who the American farmer is as mm -hmm. well. I mean, these farmers are people that we need to eat and to be clothed and to keep the world round and round. And it's one of those things that we need people, and I'm calling them advocates like yourself and what you're doing with you know the disabled and the veterans and and that's what we're trying to do to the farmer as well mm -hmm. and i and i try to do this every show and just kind of pinpoint a trait that i see in our guests within the farmer and obviously yours is a perseverance i mean mm -hmm. it's just a no-brainer that the perseverance that you continue to show after the accident to fight for people um that had not only the same accidents but people that can't do the things that you're doing now i mean it's truly incredible and, mm -hmm. I, and I appreciate that what um and i don't want to leave everest because it's such a cool mm -hmm. story i mean how many people went up the mountain with you 
Well, uh, in my little group, there was four, uh, four clients, and then we had the, the team around us that went to, to the summit of Everest. Yeah. Is there a certain time of year that's better than? Oh, there's a yeah. climbing season, okay. and it starts. They starts in April, and May and ends, but usually right around the first of June. And the summit window is typically right around the seventh to the fourteenth of May. Is the you know around that twelfth, I guess twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth is for whatever reason, it's a, kind of the prime window. Yeah. How long did it take from top to bottom? We started climbing or on bottom April. bottom to top, I yeah. should say. We started climbing from Lukla on April 6th, and I made it to the summit on May 22nd. Golly. And, and there's a lot of acclimation climbs you do in there. You go up, you come back down. You go a little higher, you come back down and to give your body time to acclimate to the elevation. And then you're waiting on weather windows. Yeah, and you're not just climbing up and then somebody's picking you up. I mean, mm -hmm. you're you're going back down yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, that's just unbelievable. Luke was, was at 8,000 feet and the summit was 29,000. Okay. And out of all the, because there's seven peaks to climb, is that kind of how it goes? Well, what the goal for me now, which I never had that, is to finish what they call the seven summits. Okay, climbing seven the, summits. Climbing yeah. the highest peak in all seven continents. And you've done how many so far? Four of the seven. Okay, so are you gonna are you gonna go for the the last three? I sure hope so. Yeah. By all rights, I have the three hardest done. That's unbelievable. And, yeah. What um what else have you done that's just complete badass, Lonnie? I mean, <laughs> you've done the Grand Canyon. What other stuff have you done? Yeah. You know, like I said, kayak the Grand Canyon. I've done it four times, actually, now, too, with other okay. disabled veterans and blind veterans. And kayak the Batoka Gorge section of the Zambezi River, which hadn't been done before, and below Victoria Falls. Uh, first blind guy to climb our uh, Devil's Tower, which is our nation's first national monument. Yep. Um, you know, I've helped create a foundation back home called Heroes New Hope and foundation but I truly just my life's passion now is to work with a lot of these existing organizations to uh, provide opportunities for other for other people yeah and, and just bring awareness to all of us of what's possible absolutely you know? what's been the most challenging thing that you've done when it comes to all this stuff oh uh, the most challenging physically demanding was was Everest yep. yeah uh, some of the um, Rivers, kayak in the Grand Canyon, you know, and the Zambezi were definitely challenges in the, as well. So it's and, and truly, I think the most challenging thing that I do though is just getting people to believe in themselves and to believe in each other and give each other a chance. Yeah, that's what we all want. So after um, I want to go back to the day of the accident, and mm -hmm. I'm obviously I'm just a curious individual. How did you feel? when you have a an incident like that that you know a couple seconds before you could see everything and now you can't see anything like how what's the the mental mindset that you have to put yourself into to keep mm. doing this stuff every single day well uh, that day that very moment uh, my mindset was stay awake and survive and i can truly say i was never one of the biggest blessings I was ever given in my life is I can truly say I was never the least bit angry or bitter at the guy that shot me. Y'all you know, still have a relationship Oh, today. amazing, yeah. We're still really good friends. I tell him all the time he's much better looking to me now than he used to be. And, <laughs> and, and, uh, and I probably wouldn't have went hunting with him if he just told me it's related to Dick Cheney, you know, all, that, all those kind of <laughs> things. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I... Uh, no, but we still go out and hunt and fish together, and he's just a good, good person and uh, speaks volumes to his character. But it was just, if I would have passed out, I, I wouldn't have been here because he initially was going to try to carry me out, and he knew he couldn't, and set me down, propped me against a tree, took his finger, cleared my airway so I could take a breath, and ran for help. And... Uh, you know, I'd have to continue to try to clear my airway. Yeah. And uh, it got to a point where I literally broke a piece off a bush and had to shove it down my throat. And it's just like, oh, stay awake, man. stay awake. And um, I lost so much blood, the docs told me, uh, you know, uh, 
the last thing I remember is after being taken from a stretcher to a boat, a boat to an ambulance, ambulance to Hilo. When they got me on the Hilo, uh, they intubated me, and that's the last thing I remember before I woke up from surgery, and they told me I lost so much blood. I'm lucky to be here. But, um, mm. you know, I, I, I remember, though, too, getting this mindset uh, of, uh, you know, how am I going to be daddy? What are people going to think of me? How am I going to do anything? And I was so fortunate that uh, just a couple of months after I lost my eyesight, one of my daughters uh, helped me mow around my little barn. And that put me back on my feet because I distinctly remember, you know, I, stand, I, I had no mobility training, but I went and I took the handle out of the broom and out the back door I went, swinging that broom back and forth in front of me like you would a cane. And I was lost as soon as I got to the yard, but I hit the edge of my little field and started going down the edge of my little field and sensed something out in front of me. And I started swinging that broomstick out in front of me, hit my little barn. I lowered my head and fought back more tears and turned and started going across the yard. And that's when I ran into my youngest daughter and I call her Bug. She looked up at me and said, Daddy, what's wrong? I said, well, I said, I'm a little frustrated. She stomped her foot, deepened her voice and yelled at me, why are you frustrated? I said, it's because I can't get into that little barn without walking through chest high weeds and I can't see to mow them. She looked up and said, Daddy, I'll help you. I'm like, what? She said, I'll help you, Daddy. And I just remember all these what ifs, you know, you're five and I'm blind and there's, there's no way. And, you know, I'm supposed to be helping you, not you helping me. And, yeah. and what if you get hurt or what if I can't? And just all these, and I just heard these words. She, I guarantee she didn't say them, but I heard them. Trust me. You can do it. Trust me. So I let, had her lead me to the garage. We jumped on the ride lawnmower. She drove it out there, shut it off, had her go back up the house and watch. Put the, and got back on the mower, engaged the blades, put my hand on, mowed a lap or two around the barn. And, and when I got off that mower, uh, she squealed and said, you did it, Daddy, you did it. And that was so instrumental that my three daughters, and it, it really was all three of them, while all these adults were telling me, no, 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 you might get hurt, these girls were saying, go, go, go. Mm -hmm. And they allowed me to see the light in the darkness. and. Uh, they changed my vision more than the loss of my eyesight ever did. Now, yeah. were you raising your three daughters by yourself? Not at that point. Okay. Yeah. And how old are your daughters? Now, you know, at yeah. the time they were uh, 5, 9, and 11. Now they are uh, 31, 35, and 37. 31, yeah, 31, 35, and 37. That's on girl dad over here. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Let's talk about that. I mean, let's talk about family. I want, I want to... Mm -hmm. I want to know the family, the the supportive group behind Lonnie Bedwell. Oh, it's just uh, it's astonishing. I uh, like I said, I just have the one brother who lives across the road from me now. Mom and dad live down the road, and then I have an extended family, cousins out galore, but that live around me, and it's friends and family. that community. Like, like I said, that little small town farming community. If Lonnie Bedwell needs help, it's a phone call away, and it's. Uh, and they're the ones that uh, truly got to the point where, okay, you're not giving up. You're there's, going on. There's nothing better than yeah. that small town community that yeah. supports each other. And, and you're a prime example for that. I mean, yeah. it seems like you have a, a great support group that goes outside of family. And I, I feel like you're one of those people that have neighbors that call themselves family as well. So. Oh, absolutely. You know, you talk about... Uh, Gamblers. There's not a bigger gambler in the world than a farmer. Every time he puts a crop out, is he going to have the weather he needs? Every time he, you know, is he going to be able? Is it going to be able to produce? Then is he going to be able to get into harvest it? And and uh, what's the prices in the market going to be at the end? And you know the sacrifices they make year in, year out, day in, day out to get to where you know our food. So many people think food just comes from the grocery store. Yep. And to see those struggles and to see those. Yeah, and then to see somebody, you know, get hurt and they can't harvest and someone else, you know, the rest of the community jump in and go harvest that crop for for them or, or you know, they lose somebody in the family and go harvest it for them or bring them in. It's, it's, it's special. It's nice. And it I'm, is. I'm glad to be from that kind of community. That's awesome. Preach, man. Yeah. Preach Lonnie <laughs> yeah. Bedway. Hell, yeah. you just, I'm going to switch this around. I'm going to go into a segment that I do on Like a Farmer mm -hmm. and it's called The Biggest Gamble. Mm -hmm. And... Farmers take a gamble every single day, and you just define that. So I appreciate you doing my job, Lonnie. <laughs> so now I want you to tell me what's the biggest gamble you believe you've taken in your life? <sighs> the biggest gamble I've taken in my life. 
Wow. Uh, I don't know. The, woo, that's tough. I think. You've at, at I mean, point, are yeah, you kidding point, me? You've yeah. climbed <laughs> you know, mountains I'm, that I can't even spell, let alone pronounce, <laughs> and you don't. Even, you can't even tell me a gamble you've taken. Uh, biggest gamble is getting a relationship. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's the biggest uh, gamble for that's me. That's true. Is getting in a relationship. Me but, and you both. But uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah, I tell people a lot that uh, two things that terrify me is fire and ladies. <laughs> so I guess there I you go. But uh, smart no, man. No, but uh, yeah, these other things are yeah, they're they're a challenge, but they're a blessing. And once again, I you know. There's nothing special about Lonnie Bedwell other than he's just been blessed with opportunity. And I think the difference, too, a lot of times is I'm willing to say, let's try it. You know, I hear so many people say, well, you got to gain my trust. I think I flip it the other way around. Yes, you got to lose mine. You know, if we're truly going to move forward, we got to we got to offer ourselves out there to each other. Yep. And and. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to give you my bank account numbers. Don't misunderstand me. But yeah, yet, yeah. But yet, yeah. There's got to be a – what's the gamble out there that you said, hey, I don't know if I can do this, but I, I need to do. I need, well, I need one biggest gamble. The two biggest. Okay. Is, is the first time going down the Grand Canyon yep. and going up Mount Everest. And my parents, my family, they asked me – I distinctly remember them asking me, Lonnie, of the things you do, why do you have to do this on the Grand Canyon? And the same thing holds true on the Mount Everest. I knew I was going to be guided by all these other disabled veterans, all combat injured veterans. And my comment to them was just what I said earlier. They gave me everything they had. They deserve everything I had. They didn't only sacrifice for our country, but they sacrificed for me. Yep. And it's because of those sacrifices that I have the ability to go out here and the opportunity to go out here and do these things. I distinctly remember being on the Grand, on the, the Zambezi River after we finished kayaking over there, talking to a gentleman over there, a local guy, and he said, Lonnie, you know, over here we don't teach the blind. We simply have them stand on the corner and beg. And I thought, what? Do they think we're that irrelevant, no value? But mm. over here we have that opportunity. And it, yep. wasn't, it wasn't that he thought that. It was truly he, we sh he had a mind shift of what's possible. Yep. And that's, that's my passion now. That is truly Lonnie Bedwell's passion, is to show us all what's possible, to give us all each other a chance, all of us. You know, I think all of us go through adversity. Yep. And I think the way to break down adversity, in my opinion, I'm a big acronym guy, the way you break, is to get over adversity, no matter how big, no matter how small, no matter who you are, is to break it down. Yep. I, Adversity, A-D-V-E-R-S-I-T-Y. The first part, the A-D, is the hardest. Acknowledge it. Acknowledge that it's going to be difficult, that, it could be, that it's going to be different, no matter how big or how small. Acknowledge it. Don't compare, oh, I don't have it as bad as you, or you don't have it as bad as me. Acknowledge it. It's happening to you right now. Acknowledge it. Once you acknowledge the differences and difficulties, then it gives you the power to do the VER. Visualize every route that you can take. And then it gives you the S, the strength to do what my daughters taught me, to stand up and step to the ITY, into you, your future, the life you can live, the differences you can make. And yeah, that's what I think it is. Lonnie, if there's one thing that you could say to the American farmer and rural America, what would it mm. be? Thank you. I want to go back to your three daughters because number one, they just sound like true badasses and they've, they have helped and mm -hmm. supported you over the last, I guess, 15 or so years. I mean, what's 26. What, yeah. 26. <laughs> yeah. Wow. There's my math. Um, what, uh, what's something that you want to say to them? Huh. Ooh. Ooh, I love you, I'm proud of you, and you're my life. You're the reason I want my heart to beat, and uh, there's, a, there's not a father out there that can be more proud of the three precious daughters that I have in my life. 
and I thank you. And the cool thing about it is, doesn't matter who's around, they'll walk up to me and they'll throw their arms around me and say, I love you, Daddy. And, yeah. That's unbelievable, Lonnie, it really is. I mean, the the support group that you've had since the accident, I know they, they were there prior to the accident. I mean, it. I can tell um, not not just these experiences are motivating you, but it's it's your three daughters that are motivating you every single day too. Yeah. What um what's next for Lonnie? What do you what do you plan on doing next? Well, um, you know, I get asked what's next. I, I I tend to always ask people, what do you want to do? Let's go try it. But on our horizon, what we hope to do is finish the seven summits. You know, our, uh, finish the seven summits and then ski to the north and south pole. Now it's called the uh, the polar slam, and it's not been done by a blind person yet. And uh, so, uh, so, say that again. That hasn't been done by a blind person. What uh, is it? What they call the polar slam. Okay, what is that? Climbing the, the highest summit in all seven continents, and then skiing to the north and south pole. And you haven't done the skiing yet. I have not. Okay. Yeah, and you know, we hope to. Our, our next trip that we truly hope to do is go to Antarctica, climb Mount Vinson, and ski to the South Pole while we're down there. And that would be five of the seven summits and one of the poles. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Do you think you'd be doing all of these activities if it weren't for the accident? Absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's if I could get my eyesight back tomorrow, would I? Yeah, in a heartbeat. Yep. If I could go back 26 years and change it, not a chance. Too many people, too many blessings, too many opportunities. And it's, it's truly, I feel so blessed to have been shown one of the purposes of my life. And I know that. I know it's a fact. Um, mm-hmm. You know, some of us, we go through wondering, what's our purpose? Well, our true purpose is what we're doing right now. You know, every day we have a purpose, and we overlook it, and I think that's one of those things. I overlooked it before when I could see, but but now I, I truly realize it's just to, one of the purposes of our life is to help each other, to help each other and be kind, and, um, yeah. You're an inspiration to us all, Lonnie. I mean, your story is just unbelievable, and, hell, you've uh, you've made a fan out of me, and I appreciate it, and you've you've given me some motivation, too. Yeah. That. I want to uh, I want to go to another segment on like a farmer. It's called this or that. Mm-hmm. So let's have a little bit of fun. <laughs> so the this or that segment, I'm going to ask you, would you rather be one thing or another? And then I'm going to let you ask me the question too, a different question. So my question today on this or that is, would you rather be a deep sea diver or would you rather be an astronaut? An astronaut. I've already been under the water on a submarine. Okay, there you go. That was easy. <laughs> do you have any plans for that? I mean, do you, any plans to go to space one day? Uh, no, but that yeah, do? I don't have a plan, but, buddy, I wouldn't turn it down. Okay, yeah. there you go. You heard it there first, man. Lonnie wants to go to space. Let's yeah. make that happen. Yeah. I'm looking at the camera right now. This guy, complete badass, the stuff that he's been doing, we yeah. need to get him to space. What? Uh, what's something that you would ask me? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So, would you rather be doing these podcasts right now or would you truly rather be out there helping somebody do something they didn't think they could do oh wow you're putting me on the spot um you know i'm going to reply to that on on both and the reason why i say both is because i truly believe um myself and the team the great team that i have we've we're building a platform Mm -hmm. with this show to highlight people like yourself and to highlight people that have done um things that they they didn't quite believe they could do if Mm -hmm. that makes sense Mm -hmm. so i think sharing the world Um, stories like yourselves and the other people that I've had on is going to help people achieve that goal. So I think I can do both at the same time. I really do. I think there's going to be some viewers that watch this episode and I think they're going to be able to get up out of bed the next day and think that they can be the next Lonnie Bedwell. I truly believe that you're, you're somebody that's going to be a, um, an idol to some people. I really do. Well, and I think you nailed the answer because I, 
I believe that too. And I thank you for doing this podcast. And I thank you for giving me the opportunity to have this platform because it does make a difference. And I know it does. And the people that uh, support us in Sightless Summits and what we do, uh, I hope they realize the impact that it truly has. It's much more than me being out there doing yeah. this. Yeah, and it, let's talk about the impact. I want you to yeah. have the opportunity to give Sightless Summits a shout out that they deserve. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I, I mean, since I, I've done some of these things, the phone calls, the text messages, the emails that I get saying, thank you for doing this for us. Thank you for being an example for my son, for my daughter, for my. Uh, you know, I had a man pull up in my driveway and said, just watching you. And I didn't know him from a nobody. Pull up in my driveway and said, you've saved my life. And he burst into tears. Come up and he shook my hand and he turned around and he walked away and left. I have no idea who he was. And um, platforms like this, it's, the outreach is just unbelievable. It's truly unbelievable. And the impact is, I thank people for this. I get to live the life, a humble life, surreal humble life, and I don't deserve the things I get, but I'm so thankful for it. But the impact that you guys have, it's not the impact I have, it's the impact you have by helping me do these things yep. that is just unbelievable. Well, I appreciate it. It's, it's a platform that we are trying to shed light on an industry being agriculture that unfortunately doesn't get enough light shed mm -hmm. on it. And you're sitting here today because number one, the, the town that you came from built you mm -hmm. and then the traits that you have gained to make you who the person you are is why you were an unbelievable fit for like a farmer. And I say that because you show that you have the, mindset to take on any adversity and do whatever you need to do to get the job done and that's what the american farmer has to do i mean you said it perfect earlier these guys they can't just shut the tractor off and and go home mm -hmm. like they have to get the job done because they have to feed america and that's something that um that needs to be that needs to be shown and this is kind of what we're doing we're, we mm -hmm. have a platform that we can show um these people that are feeding us and clothing us and and keeping the world go round because we need mm -hmm. them and and people like you coming on the show giving your story it's gonna hopefully let those people know being the american farmer to to never give up because we appreciate them oh i hope they don't yeah because we de desperately need them we need everybody you know i think uh if, if uh 9 11 didn't prove that who, how we labeled the American farmer, how we labeled the, the grocery stores, the produce industry, all those people, people as essential workers. They yep. were the ones that told, you can't go home. You have to be here. We need you. Yep. And before that, they weren't labeled that. And, but the fact is, they are, and we all are, and uh, for sure. Lonnie, you're a badass, man. I yeah. appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to say to anybody well, out there? Well, I... I think to me the kind of a, the, the overwhelming theme is no matter where we're from, no matter how we're raised, no matter what circumstance we go through, um, it's a part of our life. Blindness is a part of my life. But those things do not define us, individually do not define us unless we allow them. So when you get in those ruts and, or those things happen or you think this or that, it's shrug it off and realize that... Uh, yeah, it's a part of you. It's what made you, helps make you. But you have the control of defining your future and co-live this wonderful life that you can live because you are important and you're amazing. So, yeah, thank you. That's great, Lonnie. Thanks again for coming on the show. And thank everybody you. watching, here you go. Thank you, Thanks man. Thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate it. And everybody watching, as always, like, comment, share, and subscribe. Do whatever you got to do to be like a farmer.